Hi, I'm Musar, and today we're going to talk about chords. So this video is aimed at uh, inexperienced musicians who don't know a lot of music theory, um, experienced musicians who don't know a lot of music theory, or people who are just kind of getting started on their musical journey um, on a more theoretical or conceptual side of things. If you are comfortable with all these concepts, this video might not be as useful for you, but hopefully you can still take something from it and maybe you know some people who might learn something as well. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was this thing that I call the Musar Chord Engine. So this is the Musar Chord Engine. This is a PDF document I made a couple of years ago um, where I was trying to take a lot of the concepts that I learned in school. None of the stuff that you're seeing here is actually like super original to me. It's all been something very codified into music theory education, but I wanted to turn it into something that was easier for uh, the non-academically um, trained musician to understand. Um, and it's a, it's a short little document. It's a two-page PDF. I'm going to have a link to the download for this in the description below. Um, but, uh, I think this is helpful for uh, studying chord progressions. Uh, this is helpful for writing your own and just for kind of starting to understand the patterns that come in when working with chord progressions. Um, it expects a little bit of background knowledge, specifically to know the difference between a major scale and a natural minor or minor scale. Um, it hopes that you understand how to read Roman numerals, um, you know, where, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Um, and if you don't understand Roman numeral analysis, which this is based off of, um, I have a brief description down here, uh, just for your reference, but I'm also going to talk about it right now. So if you know how to use Roman chord or Roman numeral chord analysis, um, you can kind of skip ahead about a minute or two, and then you can just pick right back up with us. But for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, we base our chord numbers off of the scale degree, the note in the scale that the chord is built off of, going from one to seven for a seven note scale. Um, this outer triangle refers to the major scale, and this inner triangle refers to the minor scale. So if we are in the key of C, one is C, two is D, three is E, four is F, five is G, six is A, seven is B, and then we go back to our one, which is C, an octave up. And if you are building a chord based off of those uh, Roman numerals, they have certain qualities as long as you're using the notes in the key. So when you have C, E, G, that is a major chord. So our one is major, two is minor, three is major, or excuse me, three is minor, pardon me, four is major, Five is major, six is minor, seven is a special version of minor we call diminished. That's why it has this little circle or degree symbol right here. That means it's a diminished chord. It's a minor chord with the fifth scale degree lowered by one. And uh, goes back to our one, which again is major. So. Now that everyone's back, um, how do you use this? So we've divided all of the chords into one of three categories. We have our tonic function, we have our predominant function, and we have our dominant function. You can see there's a little recycling symbol here, which is meant to show the direction that the chords go in. Um, you'll see on here, I, I talk to moving forwards or rotating forwards, which just refers to going clockwise around the faces of this triangle. Um, <clears throat> so if you have never written a chord progression before, if you have no idea what you're doing, these four rules 
will get you very far. And then as you get better, you can follow what this little asterisk says and change these rules up. You don't have to look at these as rigid, structured rules that you must follow in order to correctly write good music. You can see up here, you know, there are lots of ways to write chord progressions and they're all completely valid. Um, this is more of a backup plan. This is just something to help you when you're stuck, help you when you don't know what to do. Um, and uh, as you grow, you might find that it loses its use. But for most people, these four rules will be, I feel like a godsend. Um, so the first rule is you may go from the one chord to any other chord. So this is assuming that you start on your one chord, which is what most people I know who are getting started with writing chord progressions want to do. They say, I'm in the key of C major. So my first chord will be a C major. So we can go from C to any of these other chords. We can go from C to F. We can go from C to D. We can go from C to E. We can go from C to A. We can go to any one of these chords. But once you move to a side, you cannot uh, go backwards again with these forwards rotations. So once we go from one to four, we can't go back to one. Once we go from one to three, we can't go back to one and we can't move back to two, four or six. That refers to this um, rule number three. But once you go to a side, you can actually stay on that side as much as you want. You could do one to four to two to six to four to two as much as you want. And it isn't good to necessarily stay on that side forever, but those chords are all seen as equal in predominant function. So you can kind of float between them without feeling too disconnected. Same with this side. You can jump between three, five, and seven at will. And outside of maybe the seven, these can work pretty comfortably together. At any time you want, you can rotate forwards or rotate clockwise from tonic to predominant, from predominant to dominant, or dominant back to tonic. Um, <clears throat> but there's one important caveat. When you're starting off, if you land on a five chord, if you land on this chord right here, you are required to go back to the one chord. You don't have to. There's plenty of chord progressions that we'll even talk about at the end here that ignore this rule. But when you're just getting started, it's a really, really good way to um, give yourself a good foundation of also understanding this relationship, uh, kind of ingraining in your ear the feeling of five wanting to go to one, the, the pull, the dominance that the five chord has, hence a dominant function. Um, <clears throat> so um, a good way to think about this, or an example that I gave, is if I have a chord progression in C major, let's say I wanna start on a C major chord. And then, I want to move, so I go to the predominant side by jumping to F major. And then from there, I stay on the predominant and I move to D minor. From there, I'm like, well, let's, let's start rotating sides. So let's move to the five chord. But because we did that, the fourth rule comes into play. Let me go back to one. And we could use that as either a four chord progression or a five chord progression where we have one, four, two, five, and then one. Or we could use that as a four chord looping progression. And it just keeps on looping. It feels very nice because we're following this relationship where we start on a tonic, we move to a predominant chord, which 
prepares us to move to the dominant. Then we have the dominant chord that dominates the scale, that dominates the function, and pulls us back to our tonic. Um, <clears throat> so that is kind of the, the, the core concept. If you don't want to go too much further, if that's a lot for you to take in, pause the video right now, spend a couple of minutes, maybe an hour or so, just playing around with different chord progressions. Try using these rules to ingrain within your head how these chords operate. And once you're uh, comfortable with that, you can come back and start playing with advanced techniques, um, such as starting somewhere other than your one chord. Um, for example, maybe you could start on the two chord, and then maybe go to your five chord, and then go to your one chord. This is um, a very common thing in jazz music, uh, this idea of a two, five, one cadence. Um, and this gets into very deep, advanced stuff, uh, even beyond the scope of this. But by using two, five relationships in whatever key of the chord you want to go to, can create these wonderful chaining progressions that seem to flow endlessly into each other and kind of play with this idea of tension, the five chord releasing to the one chord, preparing tension with the two, building tension with the five, falling back to the one, and doing that over and over and over again. Uh, if you're not careful, uh, you can start to lose the impression of key that you're using because um, you're taking too long to resolve to the one. But if that's an effect that you want, you can try that. You can also experiment with uh, something called modal mixture or mode mixture by ignoring uh, this thing I wrote up here about using exclusively the inner or outer sides of the triangle. Maybe we start in minor, such as A minor. And then maybe we go to a four chord, which is D minor. And then we go to a five chord, which should be E minor, if you look in the inner circle, or the inner triangle, I should say. And then we go instead to the major five. Now, this accentuates the pull back to our one chord. Um, and you can do this with other ones, like maybe you're in one major, C major, and then you're going to a minor four chord. And then you go to D for a minor, and then you go to minor five, still following that last rule. Um, that one, it felt a bit floaty. You can see we started using a lot of notes outside of our typical chord progressions. And uh, if that's not an effect you want, at least now you know. Um, uh, the last tip I have on here is that you can start to add depth to your chords by adding in sevenths, which is an additional third on top of your chord, like going from C, E, G to C, E, G, B or D, F, A to D, F, A, C. Um, and if you're, if you're confused uh, by how this works, um, we pick these numbers like seconds and thirds and sevenths based on their distance from the lowest note in the chord. That's in the scale. So when we go from one to three, that's a third. We're skipping our two. So one, two, three, that's a third. Three, skip one to four, five. Five is the third of our three. Five, skip one, seven. This seven is the third of our five. So one, three, five, seven. By stacking these thirds, we get a seventh chord, because this is the seventh of our tonic. If we're on two, Two, skip three, four. This is the third of our two chord. Four, skip one, uh, six. Six is the uh, fifth or the third of our four. And then we go one more. Six, skip seven, go to one. 
If we're building a seventh chord off of two, it's two, four, six, one. And notice how when we did that, we used all of the predominant. When we're doing one, one, three, five, seven, pretty much all the chords on dominant. Three, three, five, seven, two. Little things like that might start to pop out at you. Um, and then you can even add more uh, thirds on top, going into things called ninths, elevenths, and thirteenths, which are using more uh, notes from our scale, but kind of giving them more distance over top of our root. And um, the, the last little advanced technique I would give you is based on this one right here. When you land on five, you must go back to one. I didn't put this in the document, but the reason why I said this rule can be changed is sometimes you can go to another chord. A common example of this is something called a deceptive cadence, because we hear a five chord, and we want to go down to our one chord, or up to our one chord feels very final. We call that a final cadence or a full cadence or an authentic cadence. Um, I actually don't know if many people call it a final cadence, but I, I'm gonna call it that because I think it's good. Full cadence and authentic cadence are the classical terms, but shh. Um, but what we can do is try going to a different chord. Let's try going to, say, the sixth chord, which is the most common form of a deceptive cadence. There's our five chord. Ooh. Now that sounds familiar. Maybe it sounds familiar like this. Deceptive cadence, and since we're on the predominant side now, we can jump freely between the predominant side and go to the four. And I'm also breaking another rule here by resetting back to the one. By going from four to one instead of five to one, or four to five. Um, <clears throat> and again, that's an additional advanced technique. but. At the core of it, start on tonic, move to predominant, move to dominant, return to tonic. Move to tonic, go to, to, to dominant, come back to tonic. Um, <clears throat> and I hope that this is um, clear. Um, I've, I've sent this to a number of people and I've noticed varying degrees of, of understanding. Um, but I think with practice, it'll become very, very clear. Uh, if you have any questions about this, you can drop it in the comments below. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions about this. Again, there's going to be a link to this in the, uh, the description below. Um, <clears throat> I would like to do more videos like this, so if you have any suggestions for music theory topics I could go into, I'd be happy to do videos on that. Um, uh, but yeah, that's really uh, all I have to say about the Musar Chord Engine. Um, thanks so much for watching. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the little bell so that uh, you can get notifications of when I'm uploading videos. I'm going to try to be more uh, consistent in uploading these videos at least once every other week, ideally at least once a week. Um, and more as I, as I get more um, stuff recorded and edited. But that's really about it. Um, I'm going to hop back here. Uh, thank you to my Twitch subscribers and my patrons on Patreon. If you would like to support the channel, you can throw me a subscription on Twitch uh, or a couple bucks over on my Patreon, patreon.com slash musarmusic. There will be links to both of those in the description below. Um, have a wonderful day and uh, take care. Bye.